The Samuel Beckett Conference of the Samuel Beckett Society happened in Buenos Aires in October this year. Professor Patrick Bixby presented the article Bersani on Beckett, a Poetics of Non-Relationality. So, uh, Professor, thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to have you here. Glad to be here. Thank you, Junior. Thank you. Could you introduce yourself, please? Uh, well, my name is Patrick Bixby, and I'm uh, an associate professor of English at Arizona State University. I've been there for quite a long time now. I work on Samuel Beckett, but other topics in Irish and modernist studies. Please, could you say something about the Samuel Beckett Society and the Samuel Beckett Conference? Sure. So the, the Beckett Society was formed in 1976, so it's been around for quite a while now. Um, it was formed to bring together scholars, students, theater people, and others interested in Beckett's work in various fora to discuss his work, to plan research and uh, theatrical projects around his work. We have a rather illustrious uh, board of trustees, which include Edward Beckett, Samuel's nephew, James Curtsy, uh, Martha Faisenfeld, Lois Overbeck, John Fletcher, James Nolson, um, so we have the imprimatur of that group, and uh, the society has been holding uh, annual meetings at the Modern Language Association since its beginning. It's only relatively recently in 2015 that we held our first uh, standalone conference, which I hosted in Phoenix, uh, a place that's uh, a long way from the world of Samuel Beckett in many ways, a long way from Dublin, a long way from Paris. But uh, we had a very successful conference there, I think. And since then, it's traveled to a number of other destinations. We've been in Antwerp. We've been in Halifax. We've been in Alamaria. We've been in Mexico City. So, uh, and most recently, of course, in Buenos Aires. So a number of Spanish-speaking locations. Um, we are trying to promote these global connections with scholars in various uh, linguistic traditions and various scholarly traditions. And uh, of late, there's been a lot of interesting work coming out of the Spanish speaking world. And uh, so that contingent has very, been very prominent in the society and has really enlivened things in some wonderful ways, I think. And I hope that we'll continue to, to nurture that relationship with, with Spanish speaking scholars and to continue to include other parts of the globe. We have plans coming up to travel elsewhere with the conference that will, I hope, facilitate that. So. Um, I think we're in a strong position right now, and we're, we're continuing to uh, advance our cause. I mean, Beckett is global. <laughs> we need Absolutely. a Beckett conference in Japan. <laughs> That's on the horizon at some point, I hope. I'm certainly interested in that idea. Wonderful. Uh, well, uh, for many years, Beckett was a kind of a model modernist, uh, just out of the world, just preoccupied with linguistic topics, something like that. Uh, but now you show me a, an article called Beckett in Context, uh, speaking about the war in Ireland, Ireland many wars, in fact. Uh, could you speak about this context and uh, this kind of study, please? Yeah, you know, when I went to graduate school, um, there was still this interest in Beckett as a postmodernist, as a figure who was prescient of many of the sort of linguistic insights of post-structuralism and deconstruction. So he was treated in this sort of formalist and, and very uh, language-centric way, if you like. Um, but the generation that I belong to, and maybe the few years after me, folks like uh, Sean Kennedy, James McNaughton, uh, Emily Marat, have uh, tried to put back back in history in a sense, to return him from this sort of ethereal um, plane where he had been placed by a previous, well, several previous generations of scholars and to see him in the contexts of Ireland and France. Uh, those were tumultuous years, of course. And in Ireland, he grew up in the context of the Home Rule Movement, of the uh, Easter Rising, the Rebellion, um, the War of Independence, the Irish Civil War, nation building and state building. So in the first uh, 20 years of his life, there was a lot of turmoil uh, 
in his immediate context. And of course, he was in France during the Second World War as well. So um, he was a figure who, of course, couldn't escape history. And we've, uh, as a group of scholars, have tried to place him back into that history to understand the ways that his work responds to it. Um, and to do so without making things reductive, not a kind of one-to-one -one relationship between some historical cause and Beckett's aesthetic, but to see the various ways that that context is uh, manipulated, transformed, reimagined through his work. And we can see some phrases, some characters, some heroes in his work. It's there. <laughs> That's right, even in some of his more abstract work or work that's often read as being abstract, there are allusions to Irish history, to folks like Patrick Pierce or Terence McSweeney, who was a kind of martyr to the independence cause. Um, and Beckett plays with those figures and their perspectives and their political commitments as a way, I think, of understanding political commitment in general, um, understanding Irish history in a particular way. I've even suggested in some of my work that Beckett is a kind of eccentric historian, that he's um, playing with the idea of historical representation, with the idea of political commitment, and in doing so, creating an aesthetic that is um, subversive in some ways, which challenges the orthodoxies of nationalism, of imperialism, of Catholicism, of the Protestant church and so forth. But in doing so, um, creating a, an aesthetic that has been taken as entirely detached, but really, if we look closely, we see the ways that he's intervening in these um, various movements that uh, defined his historical context. And of course, he was in Germany uh, in the, when the modern art was selected and the uh, the generated uh, expositions <laughs> were made and who was running from Nazis too, no? Yeah, I mean, if there's any doubt that he was uh, a creature of his time, that he was very much involved with some of the broader historical movements to define the first half of the 20th century, his presence in Nazi Germany in late 1936, early 1937, put the lie to that, right? He was there um, on his own sort of uh, aesthetic journey uh, looking at galleries and various collections and training himself for what might have been a career as a curator or an art critic. Um, but given the timing, he was a uh, witness to the um, Nazi regime and its uh, oppression of artists, um, many of whom he tried to speak with or to get books about and so forth and, and encountered the resistance of the Nazi regime and their um, demonization of degenerate art. So he was uh, a firsthand witness to that. And I think, and I've written about this as well, that that experience informs his later work in important ways, even if it's not immediately evident, because he is always approaching these things obliquely. Um, but it's certainly there, and it's certainly a crucial uh, element of, of the 20th century in many ways that he was uh, very much present to. With a lot of humor, too, no? Quite often, <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> let's talk a little about uh, Leo Bersani. He was a kind of here of queer theory. Could you speak about him? Sure. Well, Leo Bersani, who I should know just passed away recently this past February, was uh, the longtime chair of the French department at the University of California, Berkeley where he was instrumental in bringing Michel Foucault on a couple of occasions. Foucault's uh, experience of the US was facilitated by Bersani, so that's certainly one of his claims to fame. But in his own right, he was a remarkable scholar of modern French literature, very much an interdisciplinarian as well. He wrote about film, he wrote about uh, the visual arts, but he's perhaps best remembered as one of the founding figures in queer studies. His uh, essay from 1987, I believe, uh, is the rectum of a grave, was foundational for the field, even though it was in many ways challenging some of the orthodoxies of the field as it emerged. Uh, his book, Homos, from 1995, is another key text. Uh, again, at a kind of um, angle to the mainstream, if we can call it that, of 
queer studies or queer theory, um, very much indebted to psychoanalysis, to Freud and Laplanche and to a lesser extent Lacan, um, and adding a, a unique voice to that field as it emerged and a voice that I think is still very relevant and will be with us for, for many years to come. I think it'll be read for, for a very long time. Well, and he was uh, summating himself uh, of the ethic, no? Uh, uh, you will wrote about the relational mode, uh, homosexualities, homosexuality offers an ethical model for Bersani because it uh, exemplifies the narcissistic subject seeking self-replicating reflections from the perspective of, of a self always already identified as different from itself. Let's speak about this relational mode, please. Right, so, so as I mentioned, and as you alluded to, he's starting from the sort of uh, mainstream of psychoanalytic thought, but he is uh, challenging some of the, the tenets of psychoanalysis in order to rethink its ethical implications. So uh, where Freud and others see the um, overcoming of narcissism as a kind of necessary step toward sociality, towards living with others, towards overcoming violent impulses and so forth, Bersani is much more interested in the ways that various forms of what he calls self-effacing narcissism, where he, he finds a model for this in homosexuality or what he calls more broadly homoness, uh, which requires identifying with sameness rather than trying to uh, accept otherness. Because for Bersani, as soon as we recognize otherness as such, we keep that basic conflict in place. So even if the effort is to overcome otherness or to identify with the other, there is uh, this kind of remainder that is always a threat to sociality towards our bonds with others. So he reconfigures psychoanalysis and asks us to see our relations with others, not in terms of otherness, but in, in terms of sameness. Um, and he takes a cue from Beckett. He takes a cue from Jean Genet, from other figures in French literature to think through this idea, particularly in that book that I mentioned earlier, Homos. Um, and that way of thinking has been, I think, increasingly important in studying Beckett as well. I've written on the topic, but so have other scholars, um, because Bersani gives us a way of thinking about ethics that seems in many cases to be akin to what Beckett is doing in his fiction. So there's a kind of homology there, a kind of resonance that uh, we don't find in other psychoanalytic thinkers or in other prominent ethical thinkers in the 20th century, really. So Bersani's ethics is a radical departure in many ways from those traditions. And in departing from those, I think it finds a kind of kinship with, with Beckett's way of looking at ethical, political, social questions. Uh, before uh, we speak about the words of Beckett, uh, let's, let's try to to discover what uh, he would like to, to he would like to say with anti-communal tolerant alterity uh, or indifference to difference, like this, something like this. Yeah, well, that's another way to formulate uh, Bersani's ethic, right? So rather than identifying difference as the key to ethical behavior, ethical thought, um, recognizing the other as such, and then trying to mitigate any kind of aggression or violence towards the other. Bersani asks us to overlook the otherness, to be indifferent to difference, as you say, and draw our attention towards sameness. And again, homosexuality is a kind of model for this, but this isn't limited to homosexual communities or uh, queerness per se, but rather uh, it, that is a model for ethical behavior that can be uh, used, recognized, uh, put into place in all sorts of different uh, contexts. It's a radical departure from the norms, though, and that makes this a kind of radical utopian thinking in some ways. But uh, in advancing this radical utopian thought, he again, it, it, we find resonance with Beckett. We find resonance with uh, Jean Genet, with these other sort of radical writers of the 20th century. 
who have compelled their readers to make some kind, similar kinds of recognitions to approach the other differently, if we read them in this way, in the way that I would recommend. And he works with Levinas too, no? Well, Levinas, because Levinas's ethic is dependent on the other and the recognition of the other, it's a kind of counterpoint really to Bersani's way of thinking. So um, if we take Levinas as being one of the key ethical thinkers in the continental tradition in the 20th century, uh, Bersani is drawing on psychoanalysis to rethink some of the suppositions, the basic suppositions of Levinas's thought and in the school of ethical thinking that derives from his work. Well, uh, you have an article called The Ethical Politics of Homines. Uh, and you say, I want to suggest that Beckett's last novel, his final standard thought experiment in prose, offers a remarkable uh, vision of human relations structured around the emergence of sameness, or more precisely, what Leo Bersani calls homeness. Let's talk about this, please. Yeah, so the um, key contextual framework for that essay is Beckett's reading of Roger Casement's so-called Black Diaries. Roger Casement was a consular official for the British government in both Africa and Latin America in the first decade of the 20th century. He's actually knighted for his service to the British crown because of the work that he did to uh, draw attention to uh, various uh, abuses of native people, the indigenous people of those areas by rubber traders and other um, imperial figures. So Beckett ha happened to be reading diaries that uh, Casement had kept during that period while he was writing How It Is, his last novel, last extended piece of prose fiction. Um, the diaries were actually used against Casements they were unearthed at an opportune time because he had uh, participated in the Irish rebellion in the Easter Rising against the British Empire um, because he saw it as his, uh, as his obligation as an Irishman and he saw it as an act of justice as well to fight for Irish independence. Um, and then he was put on trial for um, sedition because of his role in the Rising. And uh, during the trial, these diaries were unearthed and they became important to the prosecution because they uh, revealed that Casement had been engaged in homosexual activity in both Africa and South America. So they were used to smear his reputation, to uh, shift public opinion against him, to raise doubts among his Irish supporters because there was no role, as it were, for a homosexual in Irish public life at the time, certainly not as a kind of hero of Irish independence. So um, the other key feature of the diaries is that their authenticity has been contested ever since they were unearthed. Some say that they were manufactured by the British for the purposes I've just described. Others say they're authentic and um, you know, crucial documents for understanding the, the position of the homosexual in Irish public life because Casement following hard on the heels of Oscar Wilde became this very prominent figure who was associated with this uh, alternative sexuality, let's say. So these are very loaded documents and Beckett happened to be reading them as he was struggling to write How It Is, that final novel of his, which is a very strange text in many ways, even within the world of Beckett's fictions. Um, but it is about human relations in a sort of stripped down way, the sort of arrangement of bodies in this muddy underworld and the various kinds of contact that they come into, the abuses and caresses that they engage in. So one way, I think a very uh, important way to read that text is as a way of thinking about human relations, about how we interact with each other. Beckett sort of strips away all of the uh, social institutions and historical context and so forth and kind of gets down to the nitty gritty as it were about how we relate to each other. And my contention in that essay is that the ways that he imagines 
or reimagines human relations in that strange context are quite akin to the way that Casement is writing about human relations in the context of these horrific human rights abuses that he was documenting in Africa and Latin America. Documenting those abuses, even as he was also documenting his own sexual exploits with young men in each place. So Caseman is thinking through these different ways of relating to the other. His, his relationships are with local peoples. Um, and even as he's documenting these horrific abuses of the other in the name of capitalism, of profit, of imperialism, and whatnot. So both texts raise the very kinds of questions that Bersani is concerned with about how we overcome our aggression or animosity towards the other, our self-protective instincts that turn into violence when confronted with the other. And his antidote to this is this radical reimagining of human relations in the form of homonis. Um, so in many ways, I think Caseman is sort of predicting this way of thinking, offering a different way of understanding um, human relations through his private diaries, through his personal life in the context of this political morass. And then Beckett is, if not influenced by that, at least responding to similar kinds of questions. He's writing in the aftermath of the Second World War, of course, but he's also writing in the context of the Algerian conflict that France was engaged in at the time. So um, there are analogous political conflicts between um, self and other between Europe and the rest of the world uh, that were very much in the headlines and maybe even on his mind as he's writing about these things. Um, and his ethical project, if even if it's not dedicated to those specific concerns, reveals something about them, offers us a new way of thinking about them that is articulated then more directly in the, the theory of, of Bersani. Because in some way, uh, these characters are just bodies and uh, these relationships uh, of this uh, Irishman, the, this hero, uh, is just with just just body, pure uh, material corpse, some things, some things like that? Well, that's a good question. So um, Bersani's work does suggest a kind of draining away of subjectivity, a kind of jouissance, it's sort of the, the subject is shattered through these contacts, sexual contacts with the other, so that subjectivity is temporarily suspended or uh, dissolved. And we can see similar kinds of things perhaps in both Casement's writing and Beckett's writing, that the, the relations that are described are not uh, intersubjective so much. They are not forms of identification so much, but forms of mutual subjective annihilation or stripping away of subjectivity in those moments of, of sexual ecstasy or um, other kinds of ecstatic exchanges that might not be sexual, but have a similar kind of subject shattering impact on the individuals involved, which in some sense then just become bodies. And uh, the structure, the language is clean too, no? It's different. The, in Beckett's text, you mean? Yeah, well, and so the, the formal qualities of how it is are, are remarkable in themselves. The text is only structured with paragraph breaks, there's no punctuation. Um, and so the, in some sense, we might see the formal qualities of the text sort of stripping away our expectations about grammar and syntax, opening up other forms of relationality within language, if you will. So there's a kind of analogy to be identified with these uh, efforts to rethink sociality or human relations um, in an ethical way, the text is rethinking linguistic relations through an absence of punctuation, an absence of, of you know, some of the formal markers we would expect in a more conventional work of literature. Well, uh, let's talk about this Bersani's Arts of Impoverishment. 
he was uh, writing to uh, about Beckett, you know? Yeah, so that's uh, one of his most uh, widely read texts, I think, which isn't dedicated directly to uh, queer studies or queer theory, although many of the ideas that he articulates in homos and other works associated with his uh, contribution to queer studies are also articulated in Arts of Impoverishment, and they're more directly in relation to Beckett. There's a long chapter in the text which covers Beckett's entire career, uh, and the effort there is primarily to rethink what failure means in Beckett's work. So this is a kind of cliche of Beckett's studies. It was already a cliche in 1993 when Bersani is writing, but he wants to think about failure as it relates to uh, expression or language. But then again, it has this kind of ethical implication as well. So that Beckett's uh, repeated efforts to express himself, to, um, uh, to encounter or confront failure in his work uh, suggests a, a particular kind of relationship with language and then a particular kind of relationship between language and the world as well. So that the um, sort of uh, aggressive or um, an effort to, to comprehend the world, to possess the world through language is consistently undone or destroyed or otherwise negated in Beckett's work. So that kind of possessive attitude uh, of the self towards the other uh, is challenged through Beckett's uh, work with language itself. So failure in language becomes a failure of that sort of possessiveness, which then suggests all these uh, ethical um, possibilities that uh, are articulated more fully in, in Bersani's other work. What, of course, is the opposite of the fascist mode, no? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is counter-fascist for sure, and I think that helps us to understand its relevance to Beckett. We've mentioned his exposure to, to the Nazi regime firsthand in the 30s. He was, uh, you know, in Paris when it was invaded. He worked for the resistance. He had friends who died in concentration camps. He was, of course, you know, a firsthand witness to the horrors of the Second World War in many ways. So um, an ethic that is uh, counter fascist makes sense in the context of his work, certainly. Well, uh, we can say that Beckett uh, now is being studied uh, from the point of view of feminist, ecological, critic, uh, ethical uh, studies. And, uh, of course, Beckett has uh, a long story of uh, uh, studies, uh, post-structuralist studies, existentialist studies. Uh, I, I would like to ask you about this, this appropriation, new appropriation uh, from Beckett uh, in this, the, this last years, uh, after September 11, for example, and he continues to be relevant and to rediscover it. Well, I suppose there's no doubt that there's something about Beckett's work which makes it available to just about every school of criticism that has uh, emerged and been at all prominent in, uh, at least in the Western Academy since the 1950s, really, right? Um, so yeah, feminist readings, eco-critical readings, disability studies oriented readings, uh, all of these, you know, the, the interest in, in sexuality and gender and so forth. So the various fields that have uh, risen and become prominent and remain prominent in literary studies more broadly have embraced Beckett's work. He seems to have something to say to all of them. I think some of the most interesting work being done in Beckett studies is related to the question of disability and his representation of, of disabled characters, impairments, uh, and so forth. And I think it has a lot to contribute to the field of disability studies more broadly insofar as it's interested in the cultural representation of disability. Um, so there, there's a, a lot of interesting work emerging in that area right now. Could you, could you 
say something about these disability studies. What, uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, characters that can't walk or have problems of movement in Beckett, but uh, what kind of studies are emerging? Well, it, it runs the gamut. Um, one of the most important areas, I think, is in the area of um, disability performance. So um, there's been a, a lot of uh, interesting work done of late in that area um, with disabled actors uh, with a variety of disabilities adopting and adapting Beckett's work and giving it new life in uh, many ways and producing a really impactful, compelling performances of his work. So scholars have paid attention to that. Of course, there's representation of disability in his in his poetry and prose as well. So there's uh, an opportunity, I think, for the field of Beckett studies to engage with all of the the variety of representations and to make sense of them um, according to the the concepts, the theories that have emerged in the last twenty years with disability studies. Um, I've been writing recently about uh, Beckett's interest in degeneration uh, related to Max Nordau's book from the 1890s, but degeneration then becomes one of the tenets of, of national socialism in the sense we've already mentioned the uh, exhibition of degenerate art that Beckett was um, familiar with from his time in Germany. Uh, so Beckett is, is has characters who fit the mold of degeneration, as it were, and who challenge the, the norms of, of uh, embodiment of, and of course there's there are characters who also challenge the norms of uh, mental or psychological normativity as well. So he's, he's pushing against these ideas with his characters in ways that raise questions about the nature of humanity, about the limits of the human, and along with it, a, a whole variety of ethical questions, again, relating to disability and non-normativity. So um, the field, I think, is, is, is already engaged with, uh, with that work, but I think there's a lot more work to do in that vein. And I see a, a lot of exciting work coming in the, in the, in the years uh, immediately to come. Because of course, in this case, uh, health and art had a lot to do in Nazi regime. Uh, well, absolutely. So, you know, Beckett would have been familiar with, with that. The characters who inhabit his fiction in the 40s and 50s are often uh, impaired in one way or another in ways that would have been um, uh, ejected by the Nazi regime. So that's one context to understand this in. There are personal contexts as well. His mother and his favorite aunt uh, living with Parkinson's disease. Um, his uh, knowledge of uh, friends and others who were subjected to the horrors of concentration camps and so forth. Um, so it's often the case that disability is read as a kind of cipher, kind of emblem of the human condition more broadly, our, our frailty, our vulnerability, and so forth. But I think, and this is one of the insights that is emerging in this scholarship, that it has a more specific and concrete significance in Beckett's work. It's not just a cipher for something else. He's looking at disability per se, disability as disability. And you know the, the ways that he does that are not always, let's say, progressive or unproblematic. Um, from our point of view, some 60, 70 years later. But they raise all sorts of interesting questions about the representation of disability and the ethical implications of that representation that um, are broadly significant to the field of disability studies, but are increasingly important to the field of Beckett studies as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, well, to, to end this conversation, I would like to ask you for some suggestions of readings Something you you are reading now and you say it's wonderful. <laughs> well, you know there are two books uh, that 
came out in the last few years that I think are particularly important for this contextual reading of Beckett's work. Emily Moran's uh, Beckett's Political Imagination and James McNaughton's The uh, Politics of Aftermath. Those two books are um, particularly useful for um, thinking about Beckett in terms of history and politics. But as I said, there's a whole array of new work on Beckett and disability. So I, I recommend that folks who are um, trying to understand what's new and, and significant in Beckett studies, uh, you know, do their Googling, do their searches and, and find that work. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, very nice to have you here. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you, Junior. It was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, to Brazilian people and the people that will listen it, uh, thank you very much and see you soon.